Discombobulated. Discombobulated. Yeah, it's putting, I'm trying to put all the pieces together mm. of my fucking miserable life over the last few weeks. How's that going? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm like a puzzle. It's not quite finished. You know what I wanted to do, though? What? I want to do a new segment. I want to... <laughs> hey, boy. I, you really sat up and paid attention there. <laughs> I hear a new segment. I want to do a segment where we have like um, kernels of wisdom that we bring to the table yes and then we discuss that wisdom right. some would call it a nugget yes i have it but that's another podcast uses that we actually Can have we call a term. them whiz bombs yes okay we're bringing back the whiz bomb we're bringing back the whiz bomb whiz bomb and this shall be its who is your dad not that one <laughs> <laughs> no okay to see the whiz bomb and yeah it'll just be the That'll be the whiz bomb noise. Whiz bomb. Unless you want me to come up with something else. Like an explosion, maybe. <laughs> That's breaking news. Uh, it was something exciting, like, this just in. We now have proven an addiction is genetically passed on through the father. Through the father. Right, right. That would be yeah. breaking news. Yes. But I'm giving gonna, away the show a bit. We're going to discuss that. <laughs> Certainly we um, will. Um, so here's... Okay. So what do you want to do? You want to do a fucking spiel and then we go right into the show? You want to do the usual hello, how you doing thing? Or do you want to do the whiz bomb first? And we're back. Okay. Welcome to Recovery in the Middle Ages, the podcast about two There's middle-aged answer. suburban dads and their pursuit of life, love, and recovery. I'm Nat X. I'm Mike R. And boy, do we have a show R. for you today on RMA. R. Whiz bombs abound. They're <laughs> Speaking of whiz bombs, what? you got to pull up your fly. How can you see that from there? And I saw it upstairs when you were talking to my oh, wife. Jesus. I thought you were just happy to see her. Today on RMA, we discuss all things genetics, environmental. Is this thing we all have suffered from and gotten through and relapsed? Is this something that we can blame on our parents? <laughs> what about our parents' parents? Is it genetic? Is it environmental? Is it both? Today, we discuss it. We argue about it. We laugh. And... We hopefully figure something out. All this and more today on a very special edition of RMA. And welcome back to the show, Mike. Welcome back. Thanks. Monsters. And um, tell us more about this whiz bomb you were going okay. on about. So, well, okay. So the new segment is going to be whiz bomb. Whiz bomb. That sucks. I got to get a better explosion. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, so bomb. I was listening to uh, my friend Raghunath on Rich Roll this week. And those of you who know Raghunath know that he was the... Uh, he wrote... Okay. So he's a Harry Krishna guy, but he wrote a book called From Punk to Monk. That, and so he's oh, been yeah. making the rounds of the uh, the shows. I just listened to him on something. Rich Roll podcast? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, he was on this week. Okay. Right. Yeah, he's cool. Yeah, he's a cool guy. He also, um, he was the singer for a band, a punk band, what they call Krishna Core back in the 80s. Oh, yeah, 90s. like 888 was one of the, oh, no, no, 108. 108, right. It was a yeah. famous one. 108, and then, of course, you got the Crow Mags in there, and then Youth of Today, and then... Um, oh, yeah, Joey Johnson or Johnny Johnson. John Johnny J. John J. Yeah. John, John Jonathan Joseph. John Joseph, yeah, yeah. Um. Right. So anyway, so uh, so he was talking to Rich Roll, and of course, anytime you listen to the Rich Roll podcast, you're going to get a whole bunch of truth bombs, right? Mm. But he did say one thing. Um, he was, he said they were talking about like life changes and how sometimes they come out of nowhere, and then he said the pop up message which comes up to tell you it's time to upgrade your life never comes at a convenient time. Mm. And I was thinking about that because, and I was thinking about that a little bit in context of the intervention thing that we're going to talk about yes. later because it is true that people who want to quit drinking or quit using drugs always seem to put that time just out of reach. Oh, yeah. It's tomorrow. It's next week. It's I got to get through the wedding. I got to do yeah. this. I can't, I have, first I have to do, 
I have to go to my sister's brother's bar mitzvah, and then yeah. after that. Yeah, after my eye that, doctor. Right? I've seen extreme examples of this yeah. on intervention. You know, like, yeah. Last minute, oh, I have to go to the eye doctor. And you're like, <laughs> right. hey, you're about to be picked up to go to rehab. So the, I guess the point is, like, uh, is that there's never um, going to be, in your mind, a convenient time for to make big changes yeah. in your life. But you just have to fucking grab the opportunity that's put in front of you and take it. Or, hey, Victor, just mm. sign. We're posing for a picture. Yeah, press is here. Right. Um, There's no good time to disrupt, upturn your whole life and make a big change. And sometimes those changes come at you, right? And how you handle the way they come at you. And I'm not talking about a recovery context. I'm like any context, really. Like something major happens to you. And at the time, you think it's a terrible thing that's happening to you. But you realize in hindsight that it was exactly the thing that you needed yeah. to happen at the time that it happened. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, so you like assign, you know... Like the, uh, the plan, that's like God's plan. People do that. You look back on what happened and go, you know what? If that hadn't happened, all of these other things wouldn't have fallen into place. It's exactly what I needed right. at the right time. I do that too. Like, oh, my store closing happened at, you know, if just to like, look what I got out of that or look what I got out of this. You know, I think that's, um, I don't know if it's true, but it's definitely a survival instinct i think right i mean maybe we're programmed to yeah. to, to look be able to make sense of patterns so as we look night. back yeah. mm-hmm. but uh, while they're going on it's very hard for you to be like okay there is a a purpose to this there yeah. is a reason or i can use this as grist for the mill as ramdas used to say yeah uh, you can take that and you can use that experience which may initially present as a negative experience and turn it into a positive. Yeah, I'm always trying to find like, and I do it to a fault. Something's going horribly wrong and I'll immediately look for what could the potential upside be of this? And usually people going through those things with me at the time don't like that. I think um, most people want to acknowledge that the situation, whatever it is, is a problem and is hurting them and then move on. But I'm always trying to like avoid dealing with the fact that it's bad Mm-hmm. It's my toxic positivity. Right. When something happens, I immediately go for what's the upside, what's the positive, when probably I should be acknowledging for a bit, like, okay, this is bad. You know, here's how it's affecting me. And, I find that very yeah. difficult yeah. To, to just wallow in the, in the down. I don't like you to. Know? Yeah. It's, it's Some people hard. love it, it, though. Yeah, I know. But I, I think that goes to, to the, uh, the fact that I think there's a baseline you know, of happiness and the way we're wired. And some people are just wired to be more positive than others. And I'm yeah. sure there's an evolutionary reason for that. Like you need some, some aggressively positive people. Yeah. <laughs> and you to, need some to pe- balance. And then you need people who are the other way to sort of hold those people. Yeah. And there's and reality stop them from doing crazy shit somewhere you know? in the middle. Right. Yeah. I and mean, it's all about balance, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, so the other band that Raganath was head of was Shelter. I could not. Oh, the yeah. Life me. Yeah. I thought that was a Christian band. Uh, a Krishna band. Oh, I've misheard it my whole life. <laughs> I'm dead serious. When I was in high school, we were into hardcore music. And um, I thought Shelter, I thought it was a Christian band. They're good. I, You know, it's funny. I kind of missed that whole scene in the 90s because I was a deadhead back then. And, uh, you know, I started lis- I started following sort of John Joseph and listening to Raganath's podcasts, and um, which is Wisdom of the Sages, by the way. And it's a, he, you think we have trouble getting podcasts out? They uh, they do. It's a daily podcast. They oh do my it every God. single day. Well, it's a daily routine. It's a, it's a daily yoga podcast. It's, a- it's called. Yeah, and they go through this uh, Hare Krishna text called the Srimad Bhagavatam, and it's really you know there's a lot of good stuff in there about how to live your daily life. You don't have to sign up for all the mm. the other stuff, it's but practical. Yeah, use. and that's kind of how we got Jiva G on the podcast was through that whole thing. Oh yeah, Jiva G. Yeah, G- Bhakti Recovery. Yeah, and if you haven't seen or heard that um, Jiva G, I think we got a video for that on our Patreon. Did I post the video? Yeah. Okay. Patreon.com wow. slash recovery in the middle ages. Join efficient. us. Um, yeah, that was cool. It was cool. You know what else is cool? But imagine somebody questioning your sobriety and then you send them days and weeks or even months worth of reports detailing your progress. Evidence. Evidence. That would be awesome. It sounds rather sociopathic. Uh, <laughs> with Soberlink, you can do just that. You can <laughs> stalk people yeah. by sending them your 
information. Soberlink's remote alcohol monitoring system allows you to reinforce patterns of trust with those who matter most or the occasional naysayer. Mm -hmm. Here's why it's a game changer. Scheduled daily tests become part of your new routine, showing consistency in your efforts. Built-in facial recognition ensures that each test is unmistakably yours. Did you ever have an animal blow into a breathalyzer? Is that even possible? Can um, you, do they have lips? I've that, considered <laughs> it. I considered it, but I couldn't figure out how to get my cat into my car <laughs> and blow into the... Yeah, I, yeah. it definitely crossed my probably mind. probably get a dog to do it. A dog could definitely right. do it, yeah. If yeah. I had a dog, you'd just sort of put peanut butter on it. <laughs> <laughs> you want to watch a dog fillet your breathing That's, machine. Yeah. I did. I was going to say something about that, and mm-hmm. then I thought, no, I'm not going to say anything about it. <laughs> uh, the Real Magic Advanced Reporting. This feature shares your progress instantly. That is magic. With detailed, easy-to-read reports sent directly to your loved ones. It's not just about proving you're sober. It's about sharing your success, establishing patterns of trust, and dispelling doubts with hard evidence you guys know we only back what we believe in. Yeah. And this system is the real deal. This, this system <laughs> is awesome. Visit www.soberlink.com slash middle hyphen ages to sign up and receive $50 off a device. Um, they sent me this copy saying this is the April through June copy. Oh, right. But it's exactly the same copy as the January through April copy. I see. Yeah. Nothing is different, huh? Nothing is different. <laughs> Nothing will fundamentally change. Uh, nothing will come of nothing. Remind me tomorrow. Okay. Sorry, my computer wants me to upgrade. You see, mm. upgrading your life or your computer never come at a convenient time. Never. Like I was saying. Never, never, never. And sober, what is it? Soberlink.com slash middle hyphen ages. Now, they told us that they've gotten more requests and inquiries uh, at Soberlink than any other from us podcaster yeah we're the ones so apparently this has been going well so Suck let's it, keep dopey. it up <laughs> yeah, yeah we're we have the most but so that's because we know soberlink is the real deal we know that g money smooth grant uh boykin the editor at large of the rma newsroom used soberlink when he was in a point in his recovery where he wasn't struggling you know day to day to like not relapse so now he wanted to prove it because let's face it, folks, after a while, nobody trusts you. They didn't trust me. They're not going to trust you. You could tell them to you, you're blue in the face. I'm going to meetings. I did this. I did that. No. You send them your Soberlink evidence, and that's all you got to do. Soberlink.com slash middle hyphen ages. And so many people have used Soberlink to yeah. good effect. I mean, we just, Soberlink sent us the, uh, some quotes from a few people very happy with Soberlink. Oh, yeah. Uh, Soberlink provided concrete, scientific, daily proof that I was sober. And in time, my behavior, attitudes, and demeanor reflected that science. That's Krista. Thank you, Krista. The tamper-proof methods that the Soberlink device has have proven to be some of the most important components of accountability. There are no workarounds here. Thank you, Christopher. Nice. Soberlink keeps me honest, and it gives my family the proof that I'm doing what's right it saved my life basically walter thanks walter all right and you know who else we have to thank who this person that wrote us this great review that you're about to read yeah so in case y'all forgot yeah people leave reviews some people right <laughs> you people who are listening that haven't left a review but other people who who have made reviews uh have left them and they're getting <laughs> so, attention so. um so thank you to this guy he didn't leave a name or anything but no name to, um uh, no, no name. Okay. Uh, so this is Amominus. Uh, you go to Apple Podcasts, you find Recovery in the Middle Ages, and you say, rate, review, five stars. And so this person did that. It's titled, Worth Checking Out, five stars from Preston, Colorado. Worth checking out. Yes. So, yeah, two imperfect middle-aged dudes in recovery. Sometimes they say things I do not like or agree with. <laughs> I just finished listening to their entire catalog, and okay. I love their show. Uh, thanks. Clearly, I felt these guys deserved five stars, but I must go further to say I'd put this podcast in the top tier of what's still in production today. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> you clearly don't listen to a lot of podcasts. I mean, there's a big world out there, friend. <laughs> but Go listen to some better hey, shows. Listen, I'll take what, what I can get here. What's so special about this content? I'd love to know. It's not just what they offer. It's what they don't. 
Mm. It's kind of like in jazz. It's like the music is like the notes you're not playing. Yeah. Everybody's Silence playing. is a huge part right. of music. Uh, I think I know what you're saying here, but I personally find most recovery podcasts to be predictable, formulaic, and overly prescriptive. I would agree with that. Additionally, the hosts share enough about their time using for listeners to identify with, but we don't play into the whole depths of despair, just the pissing enough. contest, which just is so tip. common around the scene. Just the tip. Uh, the conversations between Nat and Mike are, for the most part, unremarkable. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I've been called worse. I agree. And, and that's per- perhaps what's so unique about the show. What's unique is we are completely unremarkable. <laughs> uh, I don't think I've ever read a better, heard a better I review. I love this. RMA's primary focus is recovery. But most episodes feature a lot of friendly banter, current friendly events, banter. <laughs> and concise. Yeah, we need to argue more. And concise explanations of how the hosts approach sobriety. To some, these conversations may seem mundane. <laughs> to, to, <laughs> to many. To most. To most. <laughs> but the listeners I, of podcasts. I think they do a lot to demystify recovery and remove barriers to entry for the rest of us. That I'm very happy Barriers with. to entry. Uh, I used to listen more to the guru types or AA-related podcasts, and I could never seem to access what they were promoting rma helps me make clear that recovery is difficult rewarding and attainable for you too now if you listen to the show and you enjoy it i'd also recommend checking out and then he gave a another podcast you can tell him since right now still available but no longer in production and of course dopey be safe have fun and enjoy the show thank you so much that was um a five-star review so thank you yeah thanks <laughs> Unremarkable. No, that was great. That was great. I have was, to say, the review is unremarkable. No, the review is <laughs> remarkable. It's the show that's unremarkable. <laughs> the whole thing is unremarkable. So, thank you so much. Um, we do, also had. Do we have some sober versaries. We did. Um, the den mother of the inner sanctum, Melissa, has scared up some monster news. Monster news, news, news. Sober versaries. Julie Keys. Has five months. Congratulations, Julie Keys. All right. That's she's, amazing. She's a professional musician. I am very jealous of her career. She's doing awesome. Jeffrey M. has one year. Charlie, our man Charlie with the Kratom podcast, uh, is booze-free for four years. And All right. And of the Kratom for one year. Go and, listen to Charlie's podcast. Yeah, it's a, the it's Kratom. Great. If Kratom's your jam, Charlie's your man. Kratom made him, and now he's got a podcast. Corey C. has five years. Congratulations right. to the Monsters. Corey, five fucking years? That's a long-ass time. Yeah. Way to go, Corey. Uh, we got some new Monsters on the uh, Inner Sanctum on the Discord chat. We've got new members. Um, we're chopping it up daily. I haven't been on in a bit. Chopping up and snorting it. You know why I haven't jumped on the Discord in a bit is because... Yeah, what the fuck have you been? Here's why, why do I have to... Do it all. <laughs> this is why I haven't, because I've been so frantic uh, with work and family and stuff that when mm. I finally think about it, I'm like, oh, I should say something. It's always disingenuous. It would feel disingenuous because I'd just be doing it to say, that's all in your head. Hi, I'm Nat. And then that's it. And then I go away. Usually you come in and you're like, hi, I'm sorry. I'm just checking yeah, yeah. in. I haven't been here in a while. I'm sorry. I love you guys. Bye. <laughs> that's, that's it for the yeah, next couple of months. That's all I'm comfortable saying in those scenarios. People want to hear from you. Yeah, well, that's what they're paying for. Right. I just don't want to disappoint anybody with my. No one's going to feel disappointed, Nat. Mm. That's it's seriously. Mm. Just you know, right, I'll say life that. is busy. That's why I put the good morning, good night thing on there. I was like, look, if I have at least time to go, good morning, okay, and then good night, and that usually. Listen, mm. we've all been stretched a little thin lately. Yes, know? so I. I, I took Jack on a. Uh, oh yeah, me and the wife took Jack on a uh, college thing this week. So last week I had to give this fucking presentation to my company. I had to stand up in front of like get ready for my unremarkable boss. discussions. Yeah, here, it here it comes. Here it comes. My boss, his boss, and um, and a, and sixty eight other people. So um, the last time I had to do one of these in house was more than. Five years ago. So I was, and I remember because I was hungover. Yeah. Uh, and I, because I was nervous the night before, so I drank too much. And then I got in there and I was kind of like, you ever get up and stand in front of a group of people and, and have to do a presentation to them and you're hungover and you realize like you're so anxious and you forget everything that you're supposed to say because and your, your brain is not actually functioning properly? I've 
Yes. That, that did not happen this time. Really? I got up there and I was, I wouldn't say I was relaxed because I, I've, I'm very anxious when I have to do these things, especially, I, I was told 10 minutes before the thing started that my boss, his boss was going to be attending. Oh my and he God. sat right in the fucking front and <laughs> looking at me the whole time. Not a, not a particularly threatening uh, experience, but because um, it was a, a, a receptive audience. But still, it was a lot of stress, right? And yeah. so that was Wednesday. And then Thursday, I roll out and put Jack and Ben and, and Aaron in the car and we drive to Virginia to go do this college thing. So it was just, it's, and, it, and that's what it's been like for the last, since the turn of the year. Yeah. It's just like jumping from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. Um, but I, I am thrilled that I'm doing it without alcohol. And I, I don't feel like any of that would help me in any way. I think what it would have done is it would have ruined the presentation. It would have made me hungover and tired to drive the next day. Mm-hmm. It would have, the whole thing would have sucked. Yeah. But, you know, as, as stressful as everything is, I'm like, I'm able to hit it with a bit of an equanimity because I just don't have that extra work to do. You know, the work around the booze. Right. Because like, that's a I'm going to drink. Work. Am I going to drink? Am I not going to drink? I'm going to have two tonight. No, I'm going to have one tonight. Well, you know what? Maybe I should have, I could probably get away with three. How much is left in that bottle? You know, that, see, all that Planning, fucking shit in your head. The hiding, the lying, ugh, yes. the money, the time, yeah. the energy. Yeah. Ugh. So, uh, well, and then I'm, Jack got sick when he got back. So it's, hmm. uh, he went to school today, but he's still a little, you know. Well, yeah, so, three kids, three different stages. Mm. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. But everybody's got a lot. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and for most people, like, this is just life, right? Yeah. This you is know? life. We're, they're not um, celebrating that they're doing it without being toasted all the time. <laughs> I can't believe I did that without heroin. But a lot yeah. of people are toasted all the time. That's well, the that's thing. That's the thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> they are. You ever, you, you, you ever see, like, some folks, like, in the supermarket, and you see, like, the red eyes and the... You know, you know, you know exactly... <laughs> How they're living their lives. And they you know? don't look like hippies or anything. They just look like regular ass 60 year old people, just stone, like, yeah. And no judgment, you know. Yeah, it's just, it is what it is. Um, I mean, a little judgment. It's the I opiate hate, I, of the masses. I've, you now. know, I've, I've realized that I, I just hate alcohol. Like, I hate it. Like, like I don't want anybody to drink. Mm. I just don't. I mean, it just bothers me when I'm I see like, people, because I know, I know what, like, there's no good that can come out of it. Mm. I don't care how much, much the amount is. I don't care whether you have a problem with it or not. It's just like, yeah. if you don't have a problem with it, then why are you drinking? Yeah. It's, <laughs> like, uh, aren't there other things you could drink? Yeah. Have a cup of tea. It's almost like hypnotizing. Everybody's hypnotized. And what I'm afraid of is now that's happening with pot. Yeah. Now the right. you know, all of that, because we have a generation of kids now who have gotten the message that alcohol is dangerous. It creates domestic violence. Um, all kinds of stuff. Um, and they, they have this thing in their head, well, I can always just uh, THC. I can take a gummy. I can do a, a vape. And that's a real slippery slope. You know, it's going to become, I don't know what we do. It's weird, too, because I don't, I don't hate cannabis the right. same way I hate alcohol. Because right? it didn't ruin your life the way alcohol did. Right. You have a vendetta. Well, I mean, I wouldn't... Did it ruin my life? I mean, it I really did a number on I, your existence. <laughs> I don't look at things that way. I like, you know, I remember Annie Grace like uh, describe my my uh, my life as as an endless series of tragedies or something like that. And, mm. and you know, maybe that's what it looks like for people from the outside, but from inside, I don't see it that way. Well, you it know? all depends I, on where you stand at the moment when you're thinking about that. If you're feeling good and doing good, and you look back at all of the tragedy, you go, ah, oh, it was all for a good purpose, but. When I was in the gutter, so to speak, you know, I didn't exactly look back at previous problems that led me there as, oh, it was for the best. So it really depends on where you're standing, how you perceive it. It's true. I mean, if I go back to 1988 when I was, you know, hiding in an alley, smoking crack while I was keeping a lookout for the cops when my friend was robbing a bodega, like, yes, that was a fucking disaster. That's your perception. But now... You know, that was great. <laughs> Just, no. All these addictions. Well, there's that hindsight and, thing again, you know. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I was thinking, I was thinking the other day about the last real big cocaine run that I had. Oh, yeah. And, um, and I don't know if I ever told this story. But I don't think so. I, uh, I'd met a friend of mine, and he was a friend who was on this podcast like really early on. Uh, and we didn't talk about it when he, when he came on the show. And I, I'm not sure why, but anyway, um, and I, I was thinking about it the other day and thinking about like how 
much my life has changed in the last 20 years. Cause this was about 20, 20 years ago. Right. Yeah. And it was, you know, started out at a bar in Brooklyn and I had a bunch of uh, drinks and then we went over to that place, Cokies and scored some <laughs> Coke from the DJ booth. Right. right. And you know, that led us to more bars. And so all night we went around the, around the horn into the morning. And then in the morning, instead of like going back to Philadelphia where I was living at the time, uh, my friend was like, you know what? Okay, I'll give you a drive back to Philly. And uh, of course, I was like, sure, I'll get in the car with this guy. We've been drinking together for 12 hours. Why not? So I get in the car, but instead of going to Philadelphia, he goes to the Bada Bing in North Jersey, which is, you know, if you watch The Sopranos, the Bada Bing was the topless bar. Oh, that, I didn't uh, know it was, was called that. Sopranos, but but it's, it's, it, it's, uh, it's got another, the real name is something else. And I drive by it every once in a while when I'm on my way to the bridge. But I forget the name. So anyway, but at this point, I'm like, I'm sort of like in and out. Like, to this day, I don't really remember a lot of that. It was just Coke. Period. You were doing Coke the whole time or drinking Coke, boop, 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 yeah, yeah, 12 yeah. straight hours. Right, right, right. So How much Coke but, but wait, did you start I'm not, with? I'm not done yet. Okay. Because we go to the, <laughs> the topless bar and we're in there and doing all, you know, and it's what, you know, you're sitting there and you're drinking and the girls coming over and everything. And you know, I'm like, listen, I remember looking at my watch and it was like one in the afternoon at this point. And I'm like, listen, I, you really, are you going to drive me back to... To Philadelphia. Can I go home now? And uh, he's like, yeah, but we got to go to New Brunswick first. And I got a couple friends at this oh. bar over there. And so then hazy, hazy, hazy. And then the next thing I know, it's like two o'clock the next morning. <gasps> and I'm like, oh, this is bad. Because, yeah. you know, my wife is in Philadelphia. Oh. And I, I, I apparently I called and left some really fucked up mess- messages on the answering machine. So this is like the, the non-fun part. Um, and... At some point, we're in some back ass place in New Brunswick scoring crack, oh. and I, I and I, I don't know any of this this area, these people. This is my, my my friend sure did. Yeah, and then I remember he had this massive rocket crack, and he puts it in his in his. There's a brim in his hat. He was wearing like a pork pie hat, and he stuck stuck it in the brim. And then we're in some bar in New Brunswick, and the band is on and dancing, and. We go in the bathroom and he loses it. He couldn't <gasps> find it. It was in, and, oh, and apparently God. it had fallen out. Oh, Jesus. And then he's like, uh, I'm like, he's like, I'm not driving you to Philadelphia tonight. I'm like, ha uh-huh. So we go back to his apartment and his apartment didn't have uh, much. You went to the apartment? Yeah. And uh. it didn't have much stuff in it. Like oh. it was like clothes around and stuff. Typical crack And he's like, yeah, he was just like, well, no, I wouldn't say that. He I think lost the rock. He lost the rock. Oh, and it was the last one oh, and there was God. no more and there was no oh, way to get any more. That's a horror story. <laughs> Uh, I was thinking about this when I was watching Intervention I'm last getting night. Physical pain. Yeah. Thinking so now I, this that. is what? 24, 40, almost 24, 40, Lost. 46 hours or something uh, like that. And he uh, he's like, all right, it's time to, you, you know, you can crash here if you want. And so out of booze, out of drugs, he goes into his room, he shuts the door. And for all I know, he brought that fucking rock in there and. Smoked it by himself, oh, which yeah, is entirely, yeah. you know, possible. Possible. But, uh, but then I start, I start coming down off of everything, and mm. I'm walking around, and I freaked out. And so I, I walk to the train station in New Brunswick at 4.30 in the morning Ugh. to take a train to Philadelphia, and then I have to go home. Oh, I, <laughs> how is that? Like, not good. Not good. I'm home. Yeah, not good. Work not trip good. is over. So uh, yeah, so that was uh, that's been on my mind lately. <laughs> yeah, and um, how far you how far you come, you right? know? And those experiences, those are the things I go back to as much as I can when I'm ever tr- forgetting how it was. I try and think of stuff like that because I think if you've been down this road, like I have, we've had similar. Everyone's been in spots like that where you're yeah. like, you find yourself with people in places that you have like a moment of clarity when you're like, you realize, oh my God, where am I? Who is this person? Yeah. Is my I mean, life is in a, danger? This was a pretty good friend of mine too. And, and it was. It took you in a place and you look at him and he's like possessed. Yeah. But you're so not, was I. Yeah. You know, it yeah was, it's. Yeah. But I got mean? home and I was like, listen, if you want to throw me out, fine, but I really need to get some sleep. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> So that is Ugh. your last crack. That was my last big run, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think ever after that. Yeah. That was like 
just after 9-11. I, w- I was not in a good headspace after 9-11. Yeah. For, well, as most I, people you know, weren't. I mean, having because I was, I was down there and it was all fucked up. And uh, so I, I, it took me a few years to get my feet back under me. But. Yeah, there's a lot of stories, um, at least on interventions and memoirs that I've read, where a lot of the trauma started for them, at least they point to 9-11 like once that happened either they lost a loved one or they were there or losing a loved one okay yeah. but i can i can also go back and selectively pick tra- sure. traumatic shit and say that's why i am yeah. the way i am and i don't i don't i don't know if that's you know if that's just the mind trying to make sense out of yeah you know random stuff or looking for an excuse to you yeah. know anyway explain anyway, it away we should talk about happier things like like your, my, uh, like you what? Me, <laughs> your son's birthday party, yes. acting thing. I mean, this is all good stuff. So yeah, we had a a, a weekend chock full of stuff. Um, my son Max turned ten, and it was it's this is a big deal. Of course, I try and you know, hey, double digits. He's like, don't say that, Daddy. That's cringy. I'm like, okay, you're ten. You're so cringe. I was very cringe to say double digits, but Max had his um, a really great time. Um, he's got so many of these little friends that are all crazy. And so we took 20 of Max's closest 10-year-olds, their parents, uh, and siblings to Medieval Times. Have you ever been to Medieval Times? I have. Uh, it's the wonderful best. place. It's like professional wrestling, but knights. And there's horses, and there's a story. And depending on where you sit, like we were in the Blue Knight area. Mm-hmm. So you have to root for the Blue Knight. Right. And you got to boo the other guys. Right. So, right. you know, I love this stuff. The kids were like, oh, my God. Like, it was the greatest thing. Uh, and we had a great time, and it was in New Jersey, so we had to, you know, yeah. armpit of America. It's all, ca- yeah. all good castles are. Yeah, that's where they are. We went to New Jersey, and we had a really lovely time. And then, You have to eat with your hands? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. I mean, they're sort of wink, wink, and they can hand you utensils sort okay. of under the table. Like, here, if you need this, you look like you need this. Were people drinking there? Yeah. Um, yes. Did the wenches bring you some ale? And they did call them wenches, which was great. <laughs> Because all the little kids don't know that word, so they're like, wench! Have you, have you seen Cable Guy? Yes. Okay, so the, the scene from Medieval Times and Cable Guy pretty so, much nails it. Yeah, right? it's, I mean, it's really like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they have beer. I didn't notice, like, a lot of, you know, drunks and things like that, but we were at, like, a matinee on a Sunday, mm. and... Um, <laughs> well, let's... Doesn't yeah. stop people in New Jersey from drinking? Yeah, there wasn't too much... Um, wait, but there is a full bar, and, you know... You can drink as much as you'd like, I guess. Do you, um, do you remember going there with the scouts? Did yeah, yes, I do. I was so just when was, the kid yeah. brought a knife and everything. Yeah, yeah. and well, and uh, then his dad got yes, yeah. yes. So there's this kid in the scout troop, and <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm hijacking your story. <laughs> no, please, <but laughs> kid in the scout troop who you know you look at him and he's got he's got his eyes are dead. They're like shark eyes, and you're like that kid's a psycho. We've <laughs> identified him since very young as <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, so he's the kind of kid who brings knives and stuff and whatever. And he's got him now a fancy motorcycle that Ben wanted to ride. And um, um, so anyway, so I, uh, I wasn't along on this trip, but uh, Aaron tells how um, this kid's father, uh, who accompanied him on this trip to Medieval Times, ended up getting absolutely shit-faced and started making, um, making a play for the nanny that he brought with him. Oh. <laughs> So I re- I think I wasn't on that trip. I just heard about it. I think Christine oh, did okay. that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember hearing about it. And uh, yeah, look, it's like a road. And then she had to drive yeah. him home because... Yeah, the nanny. The nanny had to drive because oh. he was too shit-faced to drive back from New Jersey. It's so. like if you're an alcoholic when you walk in, you'll still be an alcoholic. Like, you know, I don't think people go in there. Like, he's clearly came with that intention, you know. I'm going to get shit-faced at medieval times. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, that's a troubled dude. And, um, oh, boy. I, I used to look forward to drinking at Cub Scout events. Yeah, it's you know? like because you're getting – it always felt like I was getting away with something. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry. Back to Max and the, the thing. Max turned 10. It was really uh, – it was a lot of fun, you know, friends and family. And, um, and then we had to come all the way back. Oh, Max's big gift, what did he get for a 10-year-old? Well, you can't get him a phone because since the friends and the parents are so close – that they're all trying to tell the other one, if he gets a phone, then I got to get my kid a phone. Mm. Nobody at 10 wants their kids to have phones in this particular friend group. So Christine was like, mm, he's too young. We're not getting, we're not going to be wow. the ones that start the, right. the dominoes falling, right? right. Okay. So we got him a TV in his room. That's his like, oh. okay, now you've got your own space. You're 10. You can 
have your own TV. You can watch shows you're embarrassed about by his <laughs> older brother because there's anime or something he watches and Noah is just relentlessly making fun of oh. him. So he closes the door and puts on his anime. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was a That's good time. Cool. And then Noah, so we were at Medieval Times all day long till about 4 o'clock when we got back. And then Noah has a part in a movie that um, is pretty cool. It's like a Sundance type of thing. Like, it's an independent film, but it's a real film. They were, had, like, different locations. That's amazing. Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, he had a few lines, and uh, but it was really neat to, like, work with a real director, and, you know, there's a real crew and stuff, and you could see how it all works. This could be, like, his big break. Yeah. If he, at Sundance, somebody could be That's what I'm watching thinking. that and being like, that kid, we got to get that kid That's what I told. movie. I was like... I was like, no, because there's one sort of like star in it. Um, the guy from SNL who does Biden is like the main dude in the movie. Really? Uh, his name is uh, Alex Moffat. When you said Moffat on your yeah. social media it's, post, I thought it was Stephen Moffat. I was like, how did you yeah. get him in an episode of Doctor Who? No, I imagine. <laughs> so that's the guy. So yeah. That's Noah and Moffat. He was really super nice. Um and, and I was like the stage dad, and we showed up, and the director was really cool. Um, but yeah, he's got an IMDb, and you know, I told him, I said, even if nothing happens, even if this movie like, gets thrown away, no one ever sees it, it doesn't matter. Right. Because this is the experience. This is, you just met, uh, you know, who knows, 30 people in this experience that are in the business mm -hmm. that worked with you and said, that kid was good. Yeah. And his dad wasn't that too annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and when, you know, the, it was delayed three hours, they sat there and smiled and didn't make a fuss. Right. And, uh, yeah, it was really cool. So it was, a, it was a, a great experience. And I said, we just have to keep, you know, moving forward. You know, we had a debate at home about whether he should miss a day of school for this. And oh, of course, fuck yes. me coming from <laughs> an entertainment background and just knowing a little bit about how things work, I was telling him, you don't turn down anything. Man. Right. Like, Never turn down you, work. You get a part from your acting coach. Finally, she's like, she's, you know, gets a call from her friend in Hollywood. You take it and you run with it. You don't ask how much money. You don't ask how long it's going to take. You just do it. Yeah. And, uh, and we did. And I think it was really good. Get that kid an uh, agent. Yeah. Get him an attorney. Yes. Do you 10%. Know any? I'll take 10%. <laughs> so congrats. <laughs> Standard to fee. Standard and, uh, fee. Yeah, so good job. Noah. Very exciting weekend. But I digress. We have some did? very... Did I digress? No, I digress. Oh, this way to egress. We, we have a very exciting show today. We're talking about um, intervention. There was a new intervention episode, if some of you follow that show on A&E. So what is intervention? Are we going to roll right into it? I think we ought to. Okay. It's yeah, we're about 30 minutes or so. Mm-hmm. All right. So intervention, for those of you that, like me, who have never encountered this show before or are just vaguely aware of it, uh, it's a reality TV show. It premiered on uh, the A&E Network in 2005. Mm. Basically, it documents the lives of people who are struggling with their addictions um, as they are confronted by their family and friends in an intervention. Uh, each episode typically focuses on one or two people. It provides viewers with background on their life, the, uh, the nature of their addiction, how it impacts them and their family. Uh, and the climax of every episode is the intervention itself, which is facilitated mm -hmm. by a professional interventionist. And I, and I see my air quotes, a professional yeah. interventionist. And if the individuals agree to seek help, the show follows up with them to document their progress in recovery. Now, I was aware of this show, but I never watched an episode until last night. That was the first one? That was the first one I ever watched. See, I'm a huge fan. I was obsessed with it for the past, you know, forever. I sat there and I watched, I watched this episode with Aaron, right? And it's about this young couple who are using car fentanyl, which apparently is like That's extra the, super fentanyl. That's the, the, the elephant tranquilizer. And they're, they're alternating between that and smoking crack, I guess, to keep themselves like somewhat coherent. And um, Erin's sitting there like bawling her eyes out at the, 
<laughs> she's like, why would anybody watch this sh- multiple episodes of this show? It's yeah. like so heart wrenching well, and it's, terrible. It's supposed to resolve at the you know make you feel good eventually. Yeah, but I mean, uh, okay, <laughs> you got to go through it to but, feel it. But as you and I both know, the, that the story arc that they need for a, an A and E reality TV show is not really the way reality works. No, right? I mean, it's sort of. They try to make it look that way. It's like marketing uh, analytics. If you want to show someone that things are going well, you just pick and choose the right data. Same thing with this. You know, they get the guy. Well, I won't spoil the end, but there can be. It's the same end, though, every show, isn't it? (laughs) There's not the same always. Sometimes it goes horribly wrong. Oh. Yes. That's what that's what you watch for. You're like, it doesn't always go well. That is sick. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well, it shows the reality. Uh, you know, it's supposed to show. Don't you think that's a little exploitative? I mean, um, you you are taking people at the most vulnerable point in their lives, and you're exploiting them for entertainment purposes, or offering them free treatment. You are they say. offering them a safe exit? Are, are they even able to truly give informed consent to participating in this? Because those two yeah. guys yesterday in that episode didn't look like they were. Uh, capable of informed consent to eating a bowl of fucking Cheerios. They have. To, I think they have to, right? How can you when you're that fucked up? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> legally, that's. I think that's a problem. They haven't been sued. Do they understand and agree to the implications of being portrayed on national television as a fucking drug addict? I mean, I think. <laughs> I think they have to. And I and like. So they were showing the, the film crew following them around as they were shoplifting from stores and yeah. running away from the police. And I'm like, is this safe? <laughs> like, <laughs> just 25 <laughs> seasons later, I think you're a little late to be asking these I know, questions. But it, I mean, uh, it's, it's too it's, late. The cat is out of the bag. The toothpaste is out of the tube. Intervention is a sensation. I mean, I mean, clearly it oversimplifies the recovery process, right? I mean... Uh, giving the impression that attending a rehab is like a, uh, a surefire solution. Well, recovery is actually more complex and an ongoing process that doesn't end with your 90 days in rehab that the Discovery Channel is paying for. Well, yeah, the show has taken a lot of criticisms uh, from the recovery community over the past several years. Hmm. You know, the whole model of the intervention model has been attacked. Dr. Drew has been attacked. There's uh, different models of intervention, right? This only right. basically focuses on the Johnson intervention model, right? Uh, it's like, yeah, you know, the abstinence, you're bad, here are your defects, mm-hmm. the, the confrontation. The other thing that people um, take exception to is the surprise intervention. Uh, right, that's the I, Johnson model. So the, the Johnson model is the surprise. Yes. I'm learning something. That's why I listen to the show. And, um, and then you have... Um, there was another intervention style show where the woman made a point to say, I don't do that. They get there and they collaborate with the MI, right? Uh, Motivational interviewing. Yes. Okay. Sounds right. And, um, <laughs> and so they make them a part of the process. So there's some debate on the issue, but what is not debatable is whether or not this is entertaining. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Answer. I mean, yes, I guess. I don't know. I, so I don't know. Did you look up the data of, of how many people stay sober? In oh, time period afterwards. That's a good one. You want to know how many? I, I know. Oh, because I looked me. it up. That's I prepared I for didn't. the show. I have other preparations that I've made, <laughs> unrelated to that one. <laughs> As of the latest data, the producers of intervention, the producers themselves, yeah, report that about seventy-one percent of the individuals who appeared on the show and accepted treatment have remained sober. Seventy-one percent. Do you believe? What? Do you believe that? Wait, seventy-one percent of the people who, at the end of the show, they say who have accepted happily. treatment. Seventy-one percent of those that accepted treatment have remained sober, which implies that twenty-nine percent of the participants uh, relapsed after their time on the show. Well, I mean, it's not a usual scenario with people getting sober. Maybe everyone should get a surprise television intervention. If it's seventy-nine percent, everyone should have this. Well, and that's self-reported by the show's producers, right? And what do they mean by stayed sober? Or remain sober for how long? You know. Yeah. I mean, relapse is a common part of recovery, right? Yeah. It, it's. But well, it, it can. Be. It doesn't play as well on TV. No, it doesn't. But um, you know, that's clearly probably not true. Um, 
But it seems like some of them do get better. Sometimes they become an interventionist. In fact, <laughs> it's a uh, career path. Yeah, one of the interventionists um, that was a regular for the past 15 seasons, I think on the first or second season, she was one of the, the people that they intervened on. Oh, really? Yeah. So there are success stories, but okay. a, a lot like uh, 12 Step and a lot of things, the success, success stories are there. They're just not many of them. And so the ones like the 5% that are doing great in 12-step are doing great. Um, they're the ones that are the loudest. And so it makes everyone else feel like, um, what's wrong with me? And mm. that's the problem, I think, with it. Uh, yeah. I mean, not only... Uh, so what I was wondering is, like, how do they pick which rehabs they send people to? Because yeah. the, the episode I watched yesterday was uh, season 25, episode one. It's the first episode out, which I had to buy for $2.99, I told you you could log into my account. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't... I don't, uh, <laughs> I, I don't yes. Know. So No commercials. Um, that's the good part. Well, right. Mm-hmm. But I'm, I don't think I'm going to be buying very many. No. Uh, are there other older seasons that are included in Amazon Prime that I can mm-hmm. just go and watch? I don't know if it's included, but I own every season, Dude. every episode. <laughs> okay. I've watched every episode. <laughs> Um, it got me through the pandemic. So what, what I found was very interesting was that both of the, so there were two people, right? There was the guy and his girlfriend and they were both, you know, addicted to carfentanil and, and crack. And they sent, you know, they had the intervention and they sent, well, I don't care about spoilers because Spoiler. honestly, I don't give a shit. Yes. All right. So, so they send the girl to one and they send the guy to another. And it seems like the, they sent the guy to a nicer one and the girl to kind of a shitty one because the girl wasn't her family. Her right. family had already disowned her. So they were like, shit, I guess for the show, we have to like agree they, to send they always them do both. That. They always right? offer like the companion, you yeah. know, also. So, okay, great. But they, uh, so they dropped the, the girl off at the one and I don't really know much about that one because they didn't, they didn't really, really interview show it. Him, right? yeah. So, but the, the guy, they dro- drop him off and they interview like the chief counselor and something and he's like, we have, you know, uh, 12 step meetings, we have uh, meditation yeah. and I'm waiting for it's him to, holistic. I'm waiting for him, to, holistic, right. I'm waiting for him to say medication, yeah. but it never came out of his mouth. No, me- and meditation. then I, I kind of picked up on the fact like as they interviewed him more uh, and and the guy afterwards that there really is no this is like a classic mm-hmm. 12 step kind of a place it's not really a, a I don't think he knows what holistic means right holistic would seem to to mean things Should other than more than yeah. <laughs> right we're very holistic we do um uh, step 12 step and um meditate right that's yeah. everything. I mean, I now, I, now the whole I'll thing. be honest. I don't know. Maybe they just, for, for whatever reason, maybe the producers of this show don't want to focus on the fact that you can use medication to, to recover, which would seem to me to be an excellent platform to get that information out, that mm. Suboxone and these other drugs are incredibly effective. Yeah, I don't think they... I'm thinking back on all the intervention episodes I've watched. I can't remember if they talk about uh, medication-assisted treatment. Wouldn't that seem to be the perfect show i think we gotta talk about that we're gonna have to go back and watch the heroin triangle episodes on season 23 i think think we should do that the heroin triangle oh yeah is this wetting your appetite to do an intervention season so there are rma there are themes oh my god okay yeah this is good there's themes there's yeah so are most of the people in this show addicted to Drugs or is it, do you, they runs, deal with garden variety alcoholics as well? Everything. They'll do whatever will sell advertising, basically. <laughs> so really, though, yeah, you get all kinds of different things. So they even have a famous one where people are addicted to duster. I think there was uh, like... Oh, the, uh, the yeah. computer keyboard cleaner? They cover all kinds of different things. Um, it also goes along with the times. Like for a while when there was the heroin epidemic reached the boiling point just before fentanyl. Everything was about heroin, right? The heroin triangle, how it's all of that stuff. Uh, so this Kensington. show has lasted long, has been around longer than the opioid crisis. Oh yeah, yeah. Huh. uh, maybe. Or were they born around the same time? I think it might be around the same time. It goes yeah. back. Lots of people making money years. off addicts, man. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> definitely. But um, it's yeah. just like another exploitation of of addiction of addicts. It's just like body brokers and all these places. They, well, anybody can turn a dollar off of somebody's misery. They're going to do it, right? I see it more like you can look at it from that aspect. Or I you do. Can, why not say it's awareness? Maybe it's reaching people out there who don't know anything about this, and maybe it lets them 
see what's going on and maybe they'll notice it in someone in their family. Mm. See, so there's awareness that comes from this along with entertainment and, and money. stigma. Uh, yeah. I mean, you could, th- people will, will find negative and stuff like that if you want to call it stigmatizing. But I think that it brings awareness. It shows people what's going on and it reflects what's happening in the times. For example, this intervention, I was shocked to learn that they were addicted to carfentanil. Mm. And so this is the first episode where uh, carfentanil came out. If you don't know what that is, it's a version of fentanyl that's 100 times stronger and can literally kill you if you don't have any, you know, uh, what's the word? Tolerance. Tolerance. You can overdose by touching it. These guys were smoking that shit yeah. like in every scene yesterday. So somehow they get a tolerance through fentanyl until they needed more, they get car fentanyl, and they're completely out of it. Yeah, um, totally. completely non-functional. And and uh, and the fact that the guy's parents were letting him and his girlfriend like live in their house and just smoke fentanyl all the time was just I don't know what to think about that because on the one hand, enabling they call it. Well, yes, I guess, but it's also like, and there was an article on this in the, in the the Times, you know, uh, that we covered a few uh, months ago about how that woman who just decided that her daughter was using drugs on the street, so he she was going to allow her to use them in the house, so at least she didn't die, or she would be available to administer Narcan or something. And, yeah. and I think the mother in this case um, was kind of thinking along similar lines, like if if he's out there, yeah, you know, I couldn't let him die on the streets, right. right? So so, but the the result of that is. This guy and his girlfriend are just yeah. sitting in the house smoking fentanyl and crack all day in the house it's in a very really, nice, like pleasant looking suburban. It's so disturbing. Yeah. Um, and the kid is around. What I right. don't understand the most, like, why is that child allowed to be around dangerous drugs? The kid can die so, so from the, touching right. residue. So the kid, so the, the, the male had a child. He moved to the Philippines for the some reason. Male. The male. I'm sorry. <laughs> got, this is my legal thing going on. So, so, so defendant. The, <laughs> so the defendant. Apparently, he moved to the Philippines. Yes. Found himself a Filipina uh, woman. Yes. Married her over there. Had a kid. Yes. And then came she back to the U.S. And then her. she came back yeah. with the daughter. And then found that he was shacked up with this another drug woman. Dealer. Yeah. Uh, and. It was so hard. So, so I feel bad for this this woman from the Philippines who moves to the U.S. and doesn't know anybody, and she all of a sudden she had, she's got to yeah. deal with this this guy who is you know two time in her and four time in her, yeah. and and now he's addicted to fentanyl. Yeah, she thought she hit the jackpot. She sees this tall blonde American show up, save her or whatever. She sees you know dollar signs. Hey, hey, hey! I think that's back. being a little too. You don't think she gets there and not so fast. I mean, yeah. A lot of that is what happens. People go to these. I know. Boy, you're not too cynical, are we? You don't think that. Me? <laughs> you're the one who thinks intervention is exploitative. I, I think, do think it's exploitative. I think Americans exploit poverty in other countries. Well, I mean, in that that's way. a whole other discussion. It happens a lot. Yeah. You, know, you see it a lot. So this poor woman, she thinks she's got, you know, this rich American who's going to take care of her. And I think she actually <laughs> loved him because she was very upset by his, his behavior. I mean, how can you measure love, really? I mean, it's... Well, that's beyond the... <laughs> you can't see love. <laughs> beyond the confines <laughs> of this show. Beyond the scope of the show. Yeah. So she shows up expecting, you know, everything to be normal. Yes, she was going to move in with him uh, and it was going to be... It was yeah. horrifying. Right. And then, and so she's got this beautiful little girl that he's completely out of it for. He's nodding out. Ugh, and this, that's the most heartbreaking yes, part. Yes, that was, was watching terrible. Watching this poor kid look at her. And then the girlfriend is just passed out next to him and that's criminal like that i think cps should be in there or or the, the police the, or the mother should something go to the court and not have the him have yeah. any kind of custody mm-hmm. but you know she being from a foreign country is probably not sure how to navigate the u.s legal system and all this other stuff and so she's at right. a distinct disadvantage um yeah it's so heartbreaking right so i mean so now that this guy's Really bad choices have been splayed all over national television. Do you think he's ever going to be able to get a job anywhere? Um, <laughs> he'll do the same thing a lot of recovered addicts do. They become recovery coaches. Yeah, I mean, isn't there a finite it's, number? It of sounds like a pyramid coach. scheme. You it know? Is. Eventually, <laughs> a bunch of people are not going to be able to get jobs it's the, in know, that industry. 
the one it place. is an industry. Yeah, it is an industry. It's the one place that you can get a, a good paying job with a tattoo of the word dope in old <laughs> English on your neck. <laughs> so this is it. This is your career. But it's also you get to help people. And a lot of people who get recovery get a lot out of um, helping people. And they can make a career of it. Um, yeah, so the parents are just making it work somehow. They're, they're the ones communicating with the wife or the it's former. The, guy, the guy's parents. Yeah, the guy's yeah, yeah. parents are yeah. just propping the whole thing up. Like this poor uh, woman who married him, she's staying away from him, but they're kind of negotiating all of the, the custody and stuff. Well, this kid should not have any access to the child whatsoever. No, uh, but what the thing that came out of left field for me, a couple of things at the intervention itself. Uh, the first one was, you know, the father who was all about like, um, oh, you know, uh, he seemed like a typical suburban football dad, you know, and then it comes out at the intervention that he, in fact, had a yeah. drug problem for several years. And yeah. I'm like, what, what, what? Like, you hear him dismiss it. Too. It's like a, just a little one for a few years. Just a little drug problem just for a, a few years. Yeah, and, but I'm better now. Yeah. I'm better now. And then, which prompts the, the interventionist woman to say, yes, yes, well, um, as, we, as we know. As we all know. As we all know, uh, addiction often comes down through the father. Yes. I'm like, <laughs> what? Addiction is what passed. What fucking weird science is that? Yeah, through the male line. Passed through the male line. And That's what she said. I'm sitting there watching it with my wife. And the interventionist says that. And I go, what? <laughs> I said, <"Shh." laughs> Because she was like, shh, I'm watching. I said, no. I'm like, shh, did you hear that? She goes, yeah, passed down through the middle line. She says, Jeanette. I said, but it's not. I said, we don't know that. Right. Like, how can she just say that? Is that true? And then I started to question myself. I said, wait a second. I've been kind of out of it. I've been distracted. Is it possible? There's been this major discovery. Did we miss it? Did I miss something? I think we did a little bit. There's, did we? It looks like there's some... Well, according to ChatGPT... Oh, a reliable source. A very reliable <laughs> source. Um, it isn't one of those things that you can really say like, okay, we know it comes through the mail, but there is certain studies that show this. And I've done the research. Okay, tell me what the um, research showed. So you hadn't heard that, though, that they've proven um, addiction is genetically passed down through... A, I mean, I know there's a gen genetic component to addiction and that there may be a, a predisposition, but I don't think well, we've they've never identified that. a gene. They didn't identify a gene, but, um, so I was horrified to hear that. And then I got in a small argument with Christine over it because she goes, you don't know everything. And I, I said, no, I didn't <laughs> say I know everything. Maybe I don't know everything. However, I feel like, you know, I, we talk about this stuff all the time. We read these books. I think that would have popped up somewhere. So, the, uh, the truth is, according to chat GPT, because I had to know, because I always question myself. I always say, maybe I missed something. Of course. I wasn't paying attention. She wouldn't just say that on a, a show that's broadcast globally, right? Right. So I asked uh, our research assistant, <laughs> um, what studies show, you know, is there, it says, is there research showing an addiction is genetic? And according to our research assistant, there is research indicating that addiction can, just like we said, have a genetic component. Studies have found that certain genes can influence a person's susceptibility to addiction mm. by affecting how their brain responds to drugs or other addictive substances. However, it's important to note genetics is just one factor. And I mean, nothing about it being the male, through the male line. No. Yeah. So... Um, now, I, that's the same thing I said. I'm like, how can they say it's through the mail? So I said, what studies have shown that research assistant? And it says several, studi several. several studies have explored the genetic component. So there was family and twin studies. Uh, the studies compared rates of addiction between family members and identical versus fraternal twins. Mm. They found that individuals with a family history of addiction are more likely to develop addiction themselves. Could be a, that could be a social. Suggesting. Mm. Uh, so I don't think it's that concrete. No. Uh, then there's candidate gene studies. Researchers have investigated specific genes that may be associated with addiction, such as those involved in dopamine signaling, the uh, DRD2 gene. Variations in these genes have been linked to differences in how individuals respond to addictive substances. Mm. I did not know that. Then there was a genome-wide association study, GWAS, mm. uh, that analyzes a large sets of genetic data to identify genetic variations associated with addiction. 
The studies have identified multiple genetic loci, or loci, like from Disney, uh, related to substance use disorders, providing further evidence of a genetic component. And finally... There's animal studies studying using models have demonstrated that genetic factors can influence susceptibility to addiction like behaviors supporting the idea of a genetic basis. Hmm. Um, But while the studies provide valuable insights, it's always good to remember that there's equal parts environmental and um, genetic and um, well, it's the old saying uh, behavioral, right? Genetics loads the gun, but behavior pulls the trigger, right? Yeah, so, so I, I don't think it's wrong, uh, but I think it's more of what we already knew, that it's complex. Yeah, I mean, it's, okay. I mean, I think it's, it's there's no one gene, but there may be, like, a whole, what are you doing? You're stepping on my cord. Is that a euphemism? No, you're actually stepping on my cord. Um... Yeah, interesting. I mean, I think you can have a genetic predisposition, but it, it, without the environmental influences, like the exposure to drugs or stress or social or family dysfunctional environments, you're not going to, those genes do not necessarily express. Right. Right? It's, it's yeah. not like a cancer gene where you're m- most likely to develop the cancer. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know enough about genetics. I don't either. That's to, why I was so <laughs> amazed that this... You know, I still haven't heard anything about it coming down through the father. I, I mean, I which, would blame the mother. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I mean, blame. There's no need to blame anybody. Yeah, That's why are the we blaming? Like, well, I, we're not. But why is the interventionist blaming people? I mean, she said it so casually. Yes, like, as if it was like, oh, yes, well, we know it comes through the male line. Yeah, you know, like she just proved a point. Well, dad used to have an addiction. I mean, there it is. It's passed down through the father. So, um, but. I wanted to know what the arguments against the idea were, according to our research assistant. Okay. Uh, They have environmental factors that we talked about, uh, upbringing, social influences, trauma, stress. I mean, I put a lot more weight on that. This is the arguments against neuroplasticity. Adverse childhood experiences. Right. Epigenetics, which uh, which involve changes in gene expressions without altering the underlying DNA factors like stress, diet, substance Mm. exposure. Exposure, exactly. Yeah, psychological factors, and addiction is a multifaceted disorder. I mean, this is everything we've been saying. Yes. So is it helpful when treating someone to identify uh, potential, you know, um, ancestry that may have been, you know, addicted to alcohol or drugs? Like, I think probably only at the parents' level. You mean in order to come up with science yeah. to effectively treat addiction or yeah, if you're looking to at understand treating why a given individual is addicted to something. Yeah, to understand, to maybe focus a treatment or you don't go, well, the grandparents were alcoholics on this side of the family, but your parents are not. So is it still a genetic component? Does it matter? I mean, like, well, and, and that's the ultimate question, right? Like how useful is that information? Even, even if it's true. I mean, I guess from a scientific perspective, you can develop gene therapies right. and other ways of, of treating it medically, which, you know, a lot, a lot of the recovery communities still would have an issue with, I would think if you're, if you're looking for a medication to treat the genes, the, the genetic predisposition, but, um, well, I was hoping I could get some quotes from researchers who may have something to <laughs> say. You? Yes. Okay. And I was wondering, I said, what, um, what are the addiction experts and scientists who support the uh, genetic uh, model? What did they say? So Dr. Nora Volkov, is it Volkow? But if it's Russian, the, the W would be a V, right? Yeah. Volkov, a director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, says... Genes play a role in influencing the vulnerability of individuals to addiction. We know that there are genetic factors that contribute to differences in how people respond to drugs Mm -hmm. and their likelihood of developing addiction. Mm. Pretty straightforward. Um, Now, Gabor Mate, our favorite author of, what was his book that we read? He has so many books. Dr. Gabor Mate, many good books. Uh, He (laughs) says the, um, the other side, addiction is not solely a genetic disease. Yes. It's a response to emotional pain, trauma, and disconnection. Understanding the role of adverse childhood experiences, uh, your ACE score, social environments, and psychological factors, it is crucial uh, for effective addiction treatment. 
Um, in the realm of hungry ghosts. Yes, that's why it was a weird name. Yes. Uh, on the other side of it, Dr. Eric Nessler, who's the um, director of the Friedman Brain Institute at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, he says, studies in genetics have shown that certain gene variants can increase the risk of addiction. These genetic predispositions interact with environmental factors to shape addiction outcomes. And I think that is the most complete statement. Yeah. That is the most true. It is a complex amalgam right. of factors. So you, maybe you shouldn't necessarily treat it by trying to pray or to pray it away. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> would be my argument, but... I like the holistic approach. Sure. 12-step and meditate. No. Um, doing Medi- many Nothing things. wrong with meditation. And I think this is all just backing up. All the new research is just supporting everything we've been talking about these yes. past several years, which is... We're way ahead of the game. Both end, you know? I mean, I, I had no idea that there were different intervention models. I thought the only intervention model that existed was this Johnson model. Which has got to be the original. It's con- the confrontational one. Um, you That's know, when you, you put see people in, in a room and, yeah. and, you know, you tell people they're gonna, you're going to take them out to IHOP and then they... You write a letter. <laughs> yeah. You trick them. You it's bring the them final. into the room yeah. and then it's like, wait, where are my pancakes? And, and they're like, no, no pancakes, no, just fucking, you people know, People you haven't rehab. seen in 20 years, yeah. the brother you were estranged from, they've all got a letter for you. But then there's these other ones, right? And, and I'm guessing that uh, the show Intervention only focuses on this Johnson model because it makes for good TV, right? And that's what they've been doing since that's their brand. Never mind the yeah. fact that it's less effective than the other models, like the motivational interviewing model, where you uh, focus on enhancing an individual's motivation to change by resolving their ambivalence. It's more collaborative. It's not as confrontational. That doesn't get ratings. It doesn't get ratings. So Mike, back to on. my point about how this show is exploiting people because it's not subjecting them to the, to the best intervention that is out there or available. It's, the it's one subjecting them to the one that makes the best TV, not the one that's going to actually get them, has the best odds of getting them sober. So, yeah. you know. Uh, and then there's the community reinforcement and family training, which is craft. That's another one. I don't, I don't suppose they engage in the craft method either, uh, which it avoids direct confrontation. It teaches families how to positively reinforce desirable behaviors and discourage destructive behaviors and improve communication. Studies have shown that craft is particularly effective in engaging reluctant individuals into treatment and can be more successful in achieving this goal than the more confrontational approaches. Have they used the craft method on this show? Uh, for the intervention portion, uh, I know all of the rehabs do different stuff. I no, think I mean they for the intervention. Always piece. do that. They always do the Johnson I think so, model. Yeah. Okay. When I can. So, in, in terms of success yeah. rates, it needs to be pointed out that the non-confrontational methods like MI and Craft are much more successful. They report higher rates of engaging individuals in treatment compared to the more confrontational methods like the Johnson model. So they also tend to maintain better long-term relationships between the person with the addiction and their family because who wants to be brought into a room and, yeah. <laughs> and it, lectured? Um, it's a trust breaker, too. So being lied to, they always say that. I mean, I don't know. to me, it seems like if you're taking a bunch of people and you're using the method that best looks best on television, but is not necessarily the one with the best results, then it's inherently exploitative. Twenty five seasons, Mike. Yeah, I'm That's not saying it's not a money maker for the network program. Right? Anyway, all right. Um, do we have anything else to say about that, or are we good with um, uh, interventions for the time being? I would love to hear from the Monsterverse. Uh, I know there was. Uh, a wide variety of opinions on the show. Clearly, Mike is offended by its very existence. Um, I find it to be entertaining, interesting, educational, and bringing awareness to uh, people about what's, uh, you know, drugs and, and the bad things that can happen when you do them. Same reason I hate Dr. Drew and all that other bullshit. So I want to hear from you. Write me at Mike R at <laughs> MiddleAgesRecovery.com. Yeah. Tell us what you think. Do you... Uh, you have you been intervened? Offensive? Yeah. Have you been subject to an intervention and how did that go for you? Write us your intervention story. And we'll read it on the air. I would love that. I'd love to hear real experiences yeah. uh, from all of you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for paying attention. Yes. And now it's time for Recovery in the News. Yeah. All right. Recovery in the News. Recovery in the News. Recovery. Yo. 
we're not a political podcast, um, but occasionally politics will intrude into into our apolitical world, as it did uh, this week in a story from digitalchew.com, uh, the headline of which is, Florida GOP leader apologizes for hotel damage, admits struggle with alcoholism. Uh, the key takeaways from the story are that one George Riley, who is the executive director of Florida's Republican Party, uh, apologized for being excessively drunk and causing damage at a hotel in Kissimmee. Um, he admitted struggling with alcoholism and mental health issues and pledged to pay for the damage. 43 years old, um, he, uh, hold on a second. Um, okay, Riley's unacceptable behavior was brought to light after his sister contacted uh, Osceola County Sheriff deputies. Her concerns arose from being unable to contact Riley, who she knew was traveling on business. Uh, Riley's family indicated that he suffered from a medical condition that required medication, although specifics have been redacted from the incident report. Uh, in response to those concerns, two deputies did a wellness check on him in his hotel room. They uh, spoke to the front desk staff and two managers and were told that due to Riley's heavy drinking and extensive damage that he'd caused, uh, including broken electric blinds, his stay was not extended. One manager even reported that Riley consumed so much alcohol purchased from a hotel store that they had to restock the restaurant. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Subsequent to the denial of his stay extension, Riley presumably packed up and left. Um, they used signals from his cell phone to triangulate his location and found him at another hotel on Saturday. Uh, by the time of the deputy's arrival, he was still under the influence of alcohol, um, but the deputies thought he posed no immediate risk to himself or others, so he's, he was not forcibly committed uh, for an evaluation. So um, I guess politics is stressful in Florida. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> an old story. These guys, they, uh, they're under a lot of pressure. They're... Doing stuff they shouldn't, especially yeah. when they're against. The best is when you have a guy who's like really against something, and yes. then he's caught doing it to the max. Right. You know, right. it's a same old story. Yeah, drunk yeah. politicians behaving badly. Yeah. Well, I hope uh, Mr. Riley gets the help that he needs. I feel like you're exploiting his plight and his disease. Yes, for entertainment purposes, <laughs> much like intervention. Unlike. Uh, a and E, though we're not making any money from exploiting people. <laughs> true, this is true. Case <laughs> in point. Uh, that's it for today. Really, that was just um, just I kind of noticed bit of news, bit of exploitation, bit of news. I, I like the the fact that he dra apparently drank the t hotel bar dry. Yeah. Good that's, for you. Uh, He's yeah. trying to save us all from the poison. Yes, and we appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Mister Riley. Recovery the news. Yeah. All right news for you to use why not <laughs> why not <laughs> why not oh uh, that about does it for today is that true it's true from my end i know i had a great time did you i did so glad we got to be with you today monsters i am so looking forward to peeing yes it's going to be great Cover in the Middle Ages. The, the Great Flood <laughs> yes. is coming. So please visit us on Facebook, Middle Ages Recovery. No, Recovery <laughs> in the Middle Ages. Get us Facebook, Spotify, Instagram. Get us, get us Facebook. Yes, Facebook us. Um, so uh, on Twitter. So tweet us, twat you twit on X. Uh, support your favorite <laughs> show. Drop us a five-star review. Don't do it while you're on X. We, yes, please. <laughs> Actually, it may be even better. Yes. Um, give us a review. We'll read it. <laughs> Find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash recovery in the middle ages. We've got the inner sanctum discord discussion group, uh, cool merch that comes after a few months that my son designed and uh, we're all over Facebook and that is all we have folks. <laughs> and Isn't as there a traditional way we sign off, as we say, <laughs> non proficiat perfectum it's progress, not perfection. And don't forget that. See you next time. Stay fresh. Cheese. Be good. Bye. Bye. Bye.